This episode of Earl Grey is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. Hi, this is Robert O'Reilly. My name is Gowron. Honor to you and your house. You're listening to Trek FM. T.O. Grey Hot. Hello and welcome to another episode of Earl Grey, Trek FM's dedicated podcast to the next generation. I'm your host, Richard Marquez, and unfortunately, Lee and Amy are both out. I think Amy's on vacation and Lee's on some uh, uh, away mission somewhere else. (laughs) But uh, uh, fear not, I am not alone. Here with me is special guest, Justin Ozer. How you doing, Justin? Hi, Richard. Doing great today. Glad to be here. Awesome. It seems like every time uh, we um, any of us are gone, you're coming on now, and I you might as well be like a, a the super reoccurring guest. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, I know you have other people on too, but uh, yeah, I've enjoyed being here, and this is my fourth time. Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah. And I actually enjoy listening to you, dude. Oh, thank you. Uh, Very, very informative uh, you bring to the show or uh, lots of information you bring to the show as well. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, a different kind of topic today, though. So we'll see how that information comes in handy or not. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we're uh, so as Justin just mentioned, we're going to uh, I guess uh, trek into new uh, uncharted territory for Earl Grade 2.0. We're going to try a rewrite. Or at least uh, rewrite or create a fifth TNG movie. So this will be very interesting (laughs) because we're going to do this on the fly. We got a couple ideas on what we would like to see. And uh, that's great. Uh, But like, yeah, I'm not I'm not too I don't know about you, but I I, I don't do many rewrites in my own head. (laughs) I don't I don't tend to to do that, uh, that kind of thing either. And, uh, yeah, this is different because when I've been on before there's, you know, an episode or a set of episodes to review or a character to think about, but I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about what we're doing. So, um, so we're going forward and trying to, to write what we would like to see or some ideas of what we'd like to see for a fifth TNG movie. So, Assuming that uh, Nemesis was a financial success, let's say maybe Amy got a hold of a, the USS Imzadi, a time ship from the 29th century, had a temporal incursion into 2002, made Nemesis a financial success, and Paramount can't wait for our ideas for a fifth TNG movie. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And she's going to love that, too. <laughs> She's gonna absolutely love that. You know, it it, it definitely. I, me personally, I really like uh, Nemesis. Yeah, it wasn't the best one, but you know what? It was good enough to at least for some people to see. I mean, there was action and drama, and um, yeah, at least there wasn't conflict between characters. <laughs> it, it, it was Picard in a sense, you know, messy with Picard. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I'm not that much of a fan of, of Nemesis, and you guys have talked about it uh, otherwise, but we're going to assume everything's happened up to the point of Nemesis. There's another movie we're making, uh, let's say maybe to come out in 2004 or 2005, and we're going to see what that alternate timeline might look like. Where do you want to begin? Uh, do you want to do it after Nemesis, or do you want to do uh, maybe uh, Star Trek Four in uh, time travel? <laughs> well... <laughs> You know what? What I was thinking, uh, uh, Richard, maybe just to set the expectations. I don't expect that we'll, you know, have like a c- 
complete movie by the end of this episode. What I wanted to do was to to kind of throw out some ideas. I have some ideas. You'll have some ideas. Maybe as we're going along, we'll merge them or we'll go off in different directions. And then also, of course, it would be great if people in the Babel Conference or on Twitter tell us what their ideas would be for a fifth movie. So maybe I'll just start things off here. So, you know, one of the things that I would I would love to see in a fifth TNG movie, since we see in Nemesis that Riker is getting a captainship for the the Titan, would it be to see the Enterprise E under Picard and the Titan under Riker uh, going forward with an exploration mission to see those those kind of two crews together, you'd probably have to introduce some characters that are on, on the Titan, but I'd like to see them kind of working together. And that's something maybe a little bit different than, than we've seen in, in some other movies. Um, the, another thing that, that I really would want to see in that in a fifth movie is to have some involvement for Q because I, I love Q as a character and I think it's a shame that he never popped up in the movies. Um, and I, one of the things that I was thinking of as, as, uh, I was thinking of, of ideas here is that in the episode Q who, um, Guinan and Q have this adversarial relationship. There's not any kind of exp- explanation about it or, or what happened. I'd like to see both of them and some kind of explanation for, for what happened for their animosity that's apparently 200 years old by the time of that episode. So something related to that, maybe something that uh, the Titan and Enterprise E find on their mission of exploration that harkens back to that conflict, something like that. You know, when I was thinking about this, I actually was thinking... Maybe we could actually, if well, depending on where it was uh, on when it, the movie would be created. Obviously, now they're too old. <laughs> um, or at least I think they are. Uh, unless, unless they really want to CGI everyone, I don't know if everyone would be comfortable <laughs> with that. But like, um, I, I just think that. Uh, they should have like a uh, like a multi crew sort of thing. Yeah, I agree. You have the TNG uh, cast and crew and whatnot, uh, and also on top of that, uh, maybe the D Space Nine crew. Maybe on uh, or maybe not all of them because obviously we see Benjamin Cisco leave um, with the um, wormhole aliens, or the I'm sorry, the prophets, whichever one you choose. <laughs> Um, and you know, it, same thing goes with maybe someone from the Voyager crew as well. I mean, maybe, uh, I was thinking like a deep space assignment, uh, definitely something with the Titan is what I was thinking as well. And also the Enterprise E as well. Uh, maybe, um, the Titan gets into trouble, uh, and they send out a distress call and, uh, m- maybe it's Deanna that's sending this distress, this just <laughs> sending the distress call. <laughs> Apparently, that's a hard word to say. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, it's, and then, of course, you know, those mixed feelings that Worf has. And, it, you know, Worf's the uh, first officer, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, is, what I'm, is what I'm assuming. And they're, they're, and he's pleading the case that let's go out there and go get them. Well, there's, and, uh, you know, there, like you said, there's some kind of omnipotent, maybe Q, maybe someone else, I don't know, someone omnipotent or something like that that's causing these problems that we would have someone that like uh, that that would have experience uh, with this omnipotent uh, being like the prophets or something like that. So send someone like Cure when she's like a priest or something like that. And obviously it's a deep space assignment. So you want to send someone from Voyager or something like that. I don't know. Maybe they incorporate the other, uh, other uh, series is what I was thinking. A fifth TNG. Yeah, it would be like a multi-cross... Um, Star Trek universe sort of uh, sort of uh, movie, but that's what I was kind of thinking. But I mean, at the same time, I really want a fleet battle. <laughs> <laughs> I want to. I would. Uh, you know, and it's funny we mentioned this because I think I want to say uh, three or four days ago on a group on Facebook, I saw someone post about what would the what would another TNG movie look like. And or what would you like? And I really wished I would have read those comments because that would have been really good. But like, um, they one of them wanted a really, really big flea battle, 
and we're talking about like those fighters uh, that you see in the beginning of uh, wh- where angels fall. And um, oh my gosh, <laughs> like I mean, he was so graphic. It was like it was like three or four paragraphs of it, and then he got to the ships and everything, and it, it was it was incredible. I mean, I could see it all in my head. <laughs> I'm like, oh wow, that that sounds awesome. But of course, that's all he wants to see. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me tell you about another idea that I had. So as I was thinking about how you might incorporate Q into it, I think one of the things would be maybe you know the the Titan, let's say encounters um, an, another kind of all-powerful continuum. I'll borrow uh, something from what from the um, Voyager relaunch books. Let's say an Omega continuum that's that's mm-hmm. just as powerful as the Q continuum and really doesn't like the you know the Titan or Starfleet ship going out to a certain point. Uh, they feel you know in in some way like they need to um, I don't know test the crew or or that for for whatever reason they're attached to you know the people or, or the systems that are that are there. And I would imagine some kind of uh, conflict between that continuum and the Q continuum. And maybe the original um, conflict that you had between Guinan and Q had to do with, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, dealings that that Q or the Q continuum had with with Guinan's people and that she was somehow be able to bring in this other continuum on on her side those couple hundred years before and that's why they have such an adversarial relationship so it's kind of bringing back uh that kind of of relationship i don't know that i was just thinking out loud about it no no no, no that's fine that's fine hey that's what we're here to do rewrite <laughs> uh, rewrite or create or or generate ideas so everyone else can maybe we can even do it as like a Facebook event or something like that. You know, someone does the plot, another person, you know, keeps on going. And, you know, like one of, uh, what was it? Um, we did uh, not too long ago. Uh, I don't know if you were there for it. It was, I think it was two years ago or a year ago where someone, each person comments like a sentence or two or a couple words, like three words or something like that to do a story. And oh, wow, that thing was incredible. <laughs> that, that entire, I, you know what, that would be fun to actually read that whole entire thing. As, I mean, obviously edited out the, cause I know I did a, a couple dirty jokes on there too. Um, <laughs> but like, it would be fun to uh, uh, just like, let uh, read the whole entire thing from beginning to end and just see how, see how, it, uh, see how funny it sounds. But yeah, it, I mean, it really was funny, <laughs> but like, um, so, you know, you bring up Guinan and I'm wondering how did she, how, how it, you know, for a species that gets annihilated, I'm assuming annihilated. Uh, yeah, probably except annihilated for some survivors. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, except for some survivors. Yeah, um, where do these powers come from, or why does Q, um, I guess, can't just like, you know, snap his finger and and wipe her off the earth? You know what I mean? Like, what? Where, where, I mean, is it because of her age? Is it because she acquires these powers? She does she learn? Because actually, that's very interesting to um, bring a story like an origin story for Guinan. And I really, you know what? And thinking about it. I really wish they would have done something for her uh, in the in the TV series. Maybe an origin story of some sort to explain why Q just doesn't, you know, you know, erase her from existence from the get go. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's it's a good question, and we really for for her species, the Elorians, we really don't know too much except they're they're listeners and they have some kind of some kind of power so to to see that would be would be great i mean and i think that's one of the things they haven't even i mean they've addressed so many things in the star trek novels that's something they haven't even talked about in the in the star trek novels for whatever reason they've never gotten into Guinan's origins or her her species powers or the origin of the um the conflict between her and q so i just love to see that explained and to have it explained in some big story in a movie would be great yeah that well yeah that would be great yeah i would i would i particularly enjoy uh, watching something like that because i mean it is Bobby goldberg um i'm sure that would come with a big price tag (laughs) (laughs) to do a movie like that um but like yeah i don't know yeah i mean maybe it's too late now maybe they should have done in the TV series. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, remember, alternate timeline where we can have anything happen at that time That's right. after Nemesis. That's right. But because, <laughs> oh, yeah, it would be really hard to do something like that now. Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, I'm I'm throwing out some ideas about Q and Guinan, and you threw out some ideas about like DS9 and and Voyager crew. I mean, that's an alternate way to to go, and and I would I mean, like it doesn't to see have that kind to be the entire crew. I'm just saying, like one or two characters, maybe if that. Uh, uh, just to, just to like just to like to help them out like a guide or something like that. I mean, especially obviously a Voyager. I mean, I don't know how much Kim would be any good. Maybe he's still an ensign um, in this movie or something like that. Still, it's I don't gotta, know. Maybe he, they promote him to lieutenant. It's got to be promoted to <laughs> lieutenant. Hey, they promote him to lieutenant in the book. So I'm gonna say by a fifth TNG <laughs> movie, he's a lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, yeah. <laughs> Because that guy should be a commander or something like that, based on how much crap he's gone through. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the other idea that that I had would be that you know by this point, uh, Cisco's come back from the the Celestial Temple and he's the the commander of of DS Nine, and by this point they're recovering from the aftermath of the Dominion War, and you know he's going to kind of go out on a mission of exploration, maybe to the the Gamma Quadrant, and maybe there's some kind of involvement with the enterprise i mean i i would have loved to have seen some element of of ds9 or its characters and in, in the movie somewhere yeah that would be kind of nice wouldn't it some kind of uh yeah i mean i i just really I, you know and i really think that they should have just done a movie or something like that they did seven seasons i mean why not i mean you did it for tos or i'm sorry no they did not have seven seasons <laughs> they, <laughs> sorry guys but like it's just I, I, you know with seven seasons for you know voyager ds9 and also tng why not i mean yeah we didn't get a movie for enterprise that would be awesome actually i actually would like that but um <laughs> I, I I don't know. You know, actually, that was another idea that I had. If this was going to be coming out in like two thousand four or five, why not have some kind of involvement for the um, the NX one crew or or some elements from from Enterprise? I mean, they were thinking at at some point that there might be an Enterprise movie if it was successful, but unfortunately, it wasn't successful enough to do that. But maybe one of the things I was thinking about was that for Q and Guinan, there was this conflict that they say, said went back, you know, two centuries. And that's around the time that Enterprise takes place. So maybe this conflict also in some way had something to do in, in the Enterprise um, era. So it would have been great to to uh, to see that kind of, of involvement somewhere. Yeah, it definitely wouldn't have to be a uh, Whoopi Goldberg. So you could have any actress you want. <laughs> and you could save money to get Scott Bakula on. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's it's just it's really it's to me it's really hard to think of, um, I guess an, another TNG movie only because they're always like uh, you know it's always like politics of like obviously like resources with insurrection, uh, you know. Uh, Obviously, uh, you know the two uh, the t- uh, t- two Picards basically one surviving the other one's trying to, trying to annihilate the other um, in Nemesis, and then of course Generations is obviously um, <clears throat> someone trying to get basically to the Fountain of Youth, or or or, or at least that's how that's how it played out to me. Um, but like. I, I- <laughs> And then, of course, first contact can, can never forget first contact. That one's a pinnacle one. <laughs> but like, uh, I, you know, think of it now. I mean, they kind of. I think I don't. I don't know what kind of stories they would have. I mean, yeah, we would have to incorporate the Titan. It it would definitely have to have the Titan in it. Uh, I mean, because obviously we want to we want to uh, continue the timeline and whatnot. But like, I mean. I guess like yeah it would have to be like on the edge of space sort of thing the final frontier uh you know uh where there's you know they don't know exactly what's out there that the, the, like you know kind of like beyond mm-hmm. beyond was a great uh was a great story uh going into charting into unknown territory because they didn't know what that what was going what was happening in one and then what do you know <laughs> they destroyed the enterprise <laughs> yeah but uh in, in thinking about ideas for the episode, it made me realize how difficult it is to come up with, you know, an idea for, for let's say, a, a Star Trek movie, um, because you know we 
like may like some movies and and not others but even the ones that we don't like or that we think you know are might be bad movies it still took a lot of work to to get to that concept and to execute it and i just got more appreciation for it and in, in thinking about this because you know i have some fragments of of ideas but how you would actually you know write a full movie around that or or have have that make sense or be something people would want to see is really difficult yeah now would we have um how how will we uh be able to get uh Worf back onto the show well i think in in nemesis they didn't even give an excuse he was just kind of there <laughs> but uh well i mean i think in in the books it's not working out for him as an ambassador so he decides to join the the e again and he becomes a, a first officer but you i don't know maybe you could could take it in in a different direction and maybe Worf uh decides that he wants to serve aboard the titan instead Ooh, i don't know <laughs> if uh Amy would uh like that that would uh mess up the oh, that's whole true troy and Riker uh uh relationship or at least she might be thinking about um Worf. i mean they have that that uh, love tension and all that kind of stuff apparently you're right then it would be the love triangle <laughs> ship <laughs> <laughs> no, <boo. laughs> all right scratch that um but i i don't know like in in the books he does become first officer um aboard the enterprise e after you know Riker becomes captain of the titan i've always been a little um disappointed by that like he could have been doing something else or maybe you know really become comfortable being an ambassador after D Space Nine and continue doing that or maybe have some kind of um, I don't know mission or involvement on the Klingon homeworld but I mean you could stick him in there as the first officer to put him in the movie but it just seems like a, I don't know a step backward from being an ambassador yeah and I agree with you on that one because I, when I used to play hardcore uh Star Trek Online, I remember seeing, I mean, some people consider it canon. I mean, I guess it is canon. I mean, um, obviously, because, you know, the, the books basically talk about it. But, like, um, it, in Star Trek uh, Online, they uh, they obviously show him on the Klingon war- homeworld, and he's sitting there all alone, basically talking to himself, you know, regrets or something like that is, is what I remember. Um, and, you know, it, it would have been nice to, like, maybe launch a new book series for like uh talking about klingon politics or or even their history i mean deep uh you know something 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 i don't know like tomb raider ish (laughs) i mean not him in a suit you know like the tomb raider or anything like that but like you know finding out mysteries and and uncovering mysteries is what i mean right (laughs) but like um yeah that would i mean that yeah i i agree that it was a step backwards for him i uh, you know especially i mean there could have been so many more stories i mean we we hear a lot about andoria and uh, the poison chalice um we hear a lot about other cultures in um in all the other books now and it's like why not the klingon emperor uh why not uh let's dive into their uh, history more but like what i was thinking like so let's just say it's at the edge of space but the only way to get there is go through klingon space and there's tensions going on right now and they can't you know, necessarily cross over because <laughs> the way the Titan got there, they went around Klingon space versus going straight through, uh, right on through. So maybe that that could be a, a way for we could keep Worf as the ambassador or a uh, ambassador, uh, an ambassador <laughs> for the Klingon Empire, and that he needs just like in. Um, all good things that he has to be on board in order to, um, uh, in order, in order for them to cross over. That's true. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, yeah. that's possible. Yeah. The, the other so. thing, as I was thinking about this, of course, the last Earl Grey episode I was on was about the episode conspiracy with the parasites. And that's one of the things that they never followed up on. I thought it also might be uh, an interesting idea if that signal that was sent at the end of the episode actually reaches whoever, you know, the parasites homeworld or whoever's controlling them and that they become a threat again. I mean, that happens in, in the books in in unity but i'd probably want it to to be a little bit different like maybe of course coming back to my favorite idea q and guinan had some some kind of involvement (laughs) sorry i'm trying to work this in because i really want to see that (laughs) 
<laughs> had some kind of involvement with with these these parasites, or maybe that it was a way for the the Borg to try to kind of loosen up her her homeworld, and and that led to you know it's being taken over, it's it's destruction. Um, it's it's just one of those things I would. I want to work in like 20 different things. I don't know how many of them will work, but that's something that was never, you know, they never came back to that or, or, or what came of that, but it'd be interesting to have the origin of how they came to be or how they be, came to be a, <clears throat> a threat or maybe they're a threat, you know, once more. You know, and I actually remember, or well, I, not remember, I I edited the episode, <laughs> but like, um, yeah, listening through it, it's very interesting to uh, to uh, think about that kind of concept where, yeah, they sent the signal and everything, but a little creature, little creature, um, is willing or can take over the higher echelons of our of our command, or well, of, of Starfleet that is, and it's you know I would love to see like maybe, man, <laughs> this is going to get to aliens. <laughs> maybe we could have like. We can uh, we could take a page from Aliens, and I know Lee will probably like this. <laughs> <laughs> but like they go in, uh, let's say Mako's uh, are reenacted again or something like that, and then uh, let's say Guyan's in there and trapped in there, and she's uh, and the Queen is is able to talk versus snarl at at you and everything. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I could I could totally see that. Uh, yeah, I mean you know, it, it's a very interesting. I, I would lo- I would have loved to seen more of that. Uh, and hearing you guys talking about it, it just makes me want to see it more and more. And I and I and I read the book that you were talking about, and um, it probably would have been better to. I don't know. I mean. I guess that you could do you could do more in a book versus movies because I mean it's more visual than anything else and with a book at least you can get the feelings you can you can go into those um, uh, what's it called uh, like a text where you can hear their thoughts what is that called um, I know that's called something in writing and I can't remember what it is but anyway um, so <laughs> you know at least you could hear their thoughts and uh, you know kind of like be in their head as well as being and whoever, whatever character, maybe on um, Picard's head or something like that, what they're thinking, and you know, it gets it, it's a uh, I don't know. I I think that that's the trouble when I read books, <laughs> and then I re- and I watch the movie. It destroys the movie because it's like I know what he's thinking, I know what he wants to do, and it's it, I feel like I enjoy more of it because I know what they're thinking. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, you you can go into so much more in in a book. I mean, some of these Star Trek books are you know three four hundred pages or more, and it's impossible to put everything into into a movie. Even if if you'd want to, it'd be way too long. So, whenever you're um, taking something from a book into a movie, it's never going to be the same. You can't put the same kind of uh, you know a- attention to all of those details and include all the things. Some things need to be cut or not explained. So it's usually not not as satisfying, but I'm kind of curious since you're talking about the the books. Is there something that you know that that you've seen uh, in the the Trek novels that take place after Nemesis that that you'd like to see in a fifth TNG movie? I've said okay. So before we before I say that, <laughs> there's only one book that I've ever read that was almost exactly like the movie, and that was Jarhead. And with Jake Gyllenhaal, that movie was incredible. Okay, <laughs> I read that book and I was in Iraq. And then when I watched when I watched the actual movie, it was like dead on. So anyway, so um, that that's actually the only book. So um, where the book, you know, obviously uh, outdid the movie, which doesn't happen very often. <laughs> Or well, no, it happens often, but it's yeah, it doesn't happen very often, vice versa, or at least for me, it doesn't. Um, so one one of my favorite books that I absolutely quote a lot <laughs> is Poison Chalice. I love that book. I don't know why. It's written extremely well, and it I I mean. I'm not a fast reader. I maybe read a, a, like a three, four hundred page book in probably a day or two. You know, depending on what I'm doing. I mean, not if I if I'm obviously sitting there, you know, to read the whole entire thing. Then yeah, it'd be a lot less than that. I think but that's like, fast. It usually takes me like a week to do that. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. Oh okay. Okay. So okay. Well then, I'm fairly um 
moderate because my 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 wife on the other hand she can read through a 300 page book i i think what was it um she can read on her kindle a three or four hundred page book in about two hours and i don't know how she can do that <laughs> superpowers superpowers is all i can think of because i cannot uh, apparently, do that because yeah I, I can't i can't have her watch star trek all the time but yet when she ta- when it talks about books that's a whole different story <laughs> but like so i would love to so one of my favorite images um from the poison child is I, I can't remember I, I'm gonna have to remember the uh, the name of the ship or I think it's the Ventur- uh, Ventress or something like that but like an Enterprise or I'm sorry a Sovereign class starship comes out of warp and basically stops right in front of uh, an Andorian warship and Bashir and uh, I can't remember who is he with but he's with something they're like in like this shuttle pod of some sort basically that's warp capable that can get to end from deep space nine to andoria because he wanted to get uh information to the andorians that they have a cure for their um uh, don't spoil too much for people that haven't read it <laughs> cure for their thing okay <laughs> okay there you go <laughs> so sorry if i'm but yeah it's it's one of those um one of those images that uh, that I absolutely love. I was like, I would love to see an Endorian um, warship come up, and then a Sovereign class come up, and they're basically pointing at you, or but they're or at each other. They're, uh, I mean, we're all they're all pointing at each other, and it's like, oh wow. <laughs> I was like, I mean, and then also on top of that, I love the uh, love the description that they give when the Titan obviously goes to Earth, um, and Deanna and Riker at, are at some kind. A cafe in San Francisco, and I it's just it's so the way he describes it. Um, if I feel like I'm there, uh, it, it's like it's like wow, it's like I mean, you can he talks about the smells, he talks about the conversation and everything because they're there to uh, solve a conspiracy. I'm not trying to <laughs> spoil the book, but <laughs> I'm just telling you, you guys should. I mean, I think it's James Swallow, it, is, is, it is, is James is, Swallow, uh, yeah. It, Thank you. So James Swallow is just wow. He, he's he's incredible on how he describes his book. But like something like that, I would love. I love the whole entire, um, you know, trying to figure out the disease and trying in in all this whole conspiracy thing that's going on between the Federation and Doria. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And I just would love to uh, expand on something like that or at least see that in the screen because, I mean, just seeing in my head, I, I just it, – it felt like a, it felt like a Deep Space Nine movie. Actually, well, I know it's off topic. It's not TNG. <laughs> but, like, yeah, that's what – I mean, but it is because, I mean, it talks about conspiracy within our own uh, – within our own Starfleet or w- within the Federation and also Starfleet that it's – it, it, it you know it threatens to break up the uh, the whole entire thing maybe not break up completely but enough to uh, start a possible civil war and something like that would be like a Romulan plot versus you know within plot within our own government sort of thing so I don't know but that's it, I mean that's one of my favorite books that I absolutely love that I I, it, I mean there are several other scenes I can think of but like that's one of my favorites that I absolutely would love to see. So, how about you? <laughs> well, no, just going going off of that, actually, um, you know, it, it's possible if you had like a fifth TNG movie, you could move up all of that stuff and have the the Andorian crisis be the kind of big thing that that happens in the movie. I actually love that that uh, kind of subplot that takes place over the course of of a number of books and and you know kind of threatens the integrity of the of the Federation, but I mean actually. Something I haven't mentioned that uh, that I definitely would have loved to see in a movie is um, the Destiny trilogy, which is way, way too big for one movie. But it's yes. the most incredible crossover ever because you know they they have um, they have elements from from Enterprise, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Titan, um, and I think yeah they even have the the Aventine, which is a great slipstream ship that's my favorite ship, commanded by Ezri Dax, and the, just the. This, the whole scope of, of the, the Destiny trilogy, yeah, it's about the 
the Borg, which has been done a lot before, but it is like the best story about the Borg that's ever been written, actually. It talks about their origin, and, and it's just this huge, sweeping tale. If there's anything that's happened in the books that I'd love to see in a movie, that would be it. Yeah, I definitely, uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> but it would be, I mean, even some, yeah. I mean, even some of the like Voyager uh, books that that have came out, and you know, with the fleet going back to the Delta Quadrant and everything, it's just so incredible. I mean, I I, I don't know about you, dude, but uh, when I when I read these books, I mean, it's like. It's like a it's like a brand new episode in my head. I mean, I, I enjoy them just as much as I do. I, I actually enjoyed them more um, than the TV series. <laughs> really? I mean, well, I mean, yeah, but you know what I mean, yeah. Because yeah. there's, there's more to it. <laughs> there, there can be a lot to it, and some of it can be very cinematic. You know, as, especially something like the Destiny trilogy or the Kirsten Beyer Voyager books. There, it feels like everyone could be this just amazing movie. Um, and I actually agree with you that, at least on Voyager, that what takes place in those books is actually better than than the series overall. It's just incredible. I don't know if I would, if I would agree about that for, for some of the other series, but no, but I mean, the the things that, that happen in these books that take place after Nemesis, some of them are just incredible and some of the best writing that you've you've ever seen. And, and I wish that a lot of them were movies actually, or that they were able to, you know, get people, uh, well, I mean, it is actually happening with Discovery. Kirsten Beyer is is one of the writers, which is awesome. Um, but the, the, yeah, the stories that are there are just an inspiration and there's a bunch of them. I wish were, were movies actually. So, um, spoiler alert on Deep Space Nine. What'd you think of, um, the destruction of DS9? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't much of a spoiler alert. All right. Now we're going off on a tangent, but no, 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 I'm just curious. I, I'm just curious on what you thought of it. Cause I've met so many people that apps, they, they, just shut their books and just said, nope, I'm done. <laughs> I know some people had that reaction. It's it's fine. I mean, that that's some, well, that's a whole intricate plot that had been building up for a while, but I think that's fine. I, I definitely prefer what the original Deep Space Nine looks like, but um, I actually like the design that they had for more of a Federation station that kept some of those those elements. Uh, it didn't discourage me from reading. I was I was sad, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, I, I definitely can kept going and i still love the ds9 books yeah i uh I, it, it, well i mean i obviously it was a good build-up yeah, but like yeah it, i was i was very sad <laughs> i was like no i know well it's a recurring thing in in star trek if there's something you love it has to be destroyed i'm and like in a way i'm i'm surprised the enterprise e is still going and hasn't been destroyed in the books in some way <laughs> don't say that knock on wood knock on wood <laughs> i know but uh I, I mean actually the enterprise e by this point in the books has been in service longer than the d right i think so yes yeah <laughs> Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know what it is, but in Star Trek, ever since Star Trek three, we like to, you know, destroy ships and stations and <laughs> it, it makes great television. <laughs> it does. Well, and, and I admit, you know, even in, in Beyond, I was like, really destroy the Enterprise again. But it actually worked really well for that. So, yeah. And I, I, I yeah, I love that movie. I mean, you know, and it's funny because uh, recently there was a poll about um, which would you, which do you watch more than uh, like the original TOS movies, the TNG movies, or the new JJ Verse or Kelvin timeline? And you know, honestly, I actually watch more of the Kel Kelvin timeline ones because they are enjoyable. I mean, to me, they are. I mean, I I don't know about everyone else. I'm, I'm well, no, I do know about everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people hate it, <laughs> but like, I, I just think that. That I, I I really think that they did a really good job. I mean, besides the lens flare um, stuff that they did during the first one and second one, um, that could have been done without because uh, that was annoying me. But otherwise, the whole entire story, all the stories were great. I absolutely loved them. And you know, and that's what I was saying about the state about the space station. It's like maybe something like. Like you said, you know, uh, maybe it could be like uh, a space station blows up out in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> a research space station, or gets gets uh, uh, invaded by you know the the little dudes from uh, the parasites <laughs> from dudes. conspiracy. Yeah, the, or at least they, instead instead they're not little dudes. They got like. Um, 
I guess like carriers or something like that 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 they they get on their backs or something like that. You know, like a like a like a mother creature or something like that. But they're uh, they're like xenomorphs or something like that. <laughs> Again, we're going with uh, uh, aliens here. Um, <laughs> but like you know, they're on their backs and everything, and they uh, they're the one, it, you know turn into like a sci-fi horror movie, I guess you could call it. Um, but like uh, in that, or at least that's how it starts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um well in talking about the 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 parasites and wondering you know how they they actually take over people i mean i think the way they do it in in unity is is just that uh well that that has its whole origin story but they find a way to take over the right people and then they spread it and take over other people but um I don't know. I just wanted to see something with those parasites to kind of continue the story on on the big screen or have some kind of origin or maybe, you know, make a connection like what was originally supposed to happen where the Borg were actually controlling them to try to soften up <laughs> Earth or the Federation for, for invasion. But um, I mean, I guess the so we've we've talked about this for a while and gone around on some some different ideas. I mean, do you like my idea of having, you know, Q and Guinan be an important part of the movie, or do we go some, something else? Oh, no, else? I do. Yeah. Oh, I totally do. Um, if it would work, um, yeah, I would love to see something like that uh, happen between those two, because, yeah, like you said, there's not much about Guinan. Uh, there needs to be some kind of origin, uh, um, or at least if, if they were like, if hindsight's 2020, <laughs> um, you would think that they would do uh, an origin uh, episode in those seven seasons of TNG and then do something in a movie that would like call back to that episode mm-hmm. or at least that would, that would be great to do something like that. And, um, yeah, I mean, because we, we've seen enough of Q, uh, we saw in Voyager that their world is a, in, in a metaphor is, is a continuous highway. Right. So, and really they don't really talk about their origins either. They say they're, they're for, they're from the beginning of time in the universe, supposedly. So I don't know how that works. If there was, you know, like an atom or something like that to start the world or start the universe. Um, but like, I, I, or maybe, maybe it was them. Maybe they were playing pool and, uh, <laughs> that's what they're doing. That's how. That's, that's how you what got started our universe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. they're playing pool. <laughs> I, I think if, if I remember reading right, like the 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 I think the Voyager episode where they introduced the the Omega molecule. I think there's some kind of speculation that it's because of something that came about at the Big Bang, and if it's something that's responsible for this other continuum, like the Omega continuum at the start of the Big Bang, maybe they've had this whole, you know. Uh, adversarial relationship or warfare between them since the beginning of time and we're just going to start seeing that in a movie i'd i'd like to see something like um you know another uh, continuum or some powerful beings that can be real adversaries for the the q continuum we see it in some of the books but we've never seen anything like that on screen when Q's there or the Q continuum there's always this internal conflict between different members of the continuum but there's not really like an adversary that can take them on yeah exactly like they're they're but they're the top of the food chain <laughs> that's what they Quite like literally. to think of themselves yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, say, yeah, considering we don't see them really consume anything, but that's okay. <laughs> energy, they consume energy. <laughs> yep. But you know, I I agree. Uh, definitely, uh, I would love to see a background story of Guinan. Um, I would love to see a comp. Uh, you know, maybe maybe they were past lovers. Q uh-huh. and Guinan. Yeah, why not? Ooh, hadn't thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> See, I always thought of it as as Guinan and Picard being past lovers at some point. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah no, 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 and 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 I get that. I'm just saying, like, if she's like seven or eight hundred years old, yeah. and obviously Q is, you know, billions of years old, maybe. It, yeah, whatever. You know, yeah, timeless. There you yeah. go. Um, you know, I would assume that you know he looked the same as he did back then and maybe he turned on the charm to her back then and maybe that was the reason why she got out of the Borg uh, invasion because he knew about it and he didn't tell her and that's the reason why she's mad at him 
and maybe he gave her powers to uh oh wow <laughs> okay okay so here we go so so maybe uh he gave her some kind of a, a, a part of his power or something like that maybe he's not all powerful a, mainly because he can his uh, the rest of the Q continuum can take his powers and and, and whatnot when he's uh, mischievous and part of his powers were transferred over to her because they were past lovers or whatever or maybe there was some kind of like regret that he wished that he could give her something and instead of giving her whole entire planet back and having the Borg reverse what they were doing maybe what they uh, maybe that power is is basically a he gave her uh, everlasting life in a sense and now she lives hmm. forever <laughs> so she has she can live that long but other Elorians can't right huh <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I could I could probably keep going, but <laughs> but like uh, yeah, I yeah, I, I I guess that would probably explain the whole uh, why they don't like each other anymore because she's in uh, she regrets uh, you know going with him when she really wanted to be with her family and all that. That's if all of her uh, that's if some of her family ex- um, survived. I don't know. Because we don't hear about an Alorian, another Alorian uh, that lives that long, do we? Or is Dr. Soren. Uh, I don't know. Uh, lived that, no, I don't know Dr. if they Soren talk about Soren living quite that long, do they? I mean, he's. I don't he, think so. He, I mean, he clearly lives for a while between the event, first events and generations and then later in the movie, but it's a, it's a good question. Um,. You know, we, huh. we do see an Elorian in Deep Space Nine, though, in the episode Rivals. You know, the the one where the the yeah. guy competes with Quark with his magic gambling machine. But um, I don't think we. I mean, we really just don't know much about them as as a species or how long they live or how things work for them at all. So definitely like to learn more. We could definitely go on for days for that one. <laughs> <laughs> But that one makes more sense to me. <laughs> All right. So, listeners, when this episode drops, let us know what your opinions are. What would you like to see in a fifth TNG movie or sixth, seventh, or however many you want to make? Um, and we'll do, we'll come back and we'll bring Justin on. We'll bring Amy and we'll bring a- uh, Lee on as well. And... We'll all mess this story all together and see if we can come up with a really good TNG movie. Because based on what we've been talking about, it sounds like we're going to come up with a really awesome uh, movie. Uh, it, it's going to be expensive, so but you know, budgets are not money is not a factor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we'll definitely have to do that. <laughs> That's no problem because also part of Amy's temporal incursion was dropping off a boatload of money at Paramount in 2002 so they could make a gigantic fifth movie. Or tell them to sit on it, let it, you know, like sit in some kind of bank account or something like that and let it grow. <laughs> Inflation. Come on. <laughs> yeah. That would be great. Hello, Earl Grey listeners. I really want to strip the next generation fifth movie down to really the bare bones and that's kind of where I want to go with it I want to focus on a couple of characters in the story like the Enterprise has never really felt like a character in the next generation movies and I want to take it away likewise with the crew from Troy to Crusher and nearly everyone in between but Picard and Data with the rest often reduced to comic relief or cameos in their own series I really think like a, a pared down next generation movie would really make it stand aside. And the idea I've gone with will be something that takes place 16 years after Nemesis, just in real time, just um, just like the real time that's passed as well. And I like to see the movie focused on Picard and Worf, a certainly older pairing of Picard and Worf, though I'm pretty sure Patrick Stewart never ages. So the movie opens a few years after Nemesis and we see the Next Generation crew reunited at the annual war memorial to honour the dead and remember the Dominion War. We pass through the crowd and see cast members from the Next Generation, Deep Space Nine and Voyager, and many familiar faces in fleeting fleeting shots as the Federation president gives a speech. Then there's a large explosion and mass panic, screaming and terror. We are disorientated and the camera is being pulled all around the carnage. Riker, Troy, Crusher and La Forge are killed. Picard and Worf look stunned and covered in blood and ash from the attack. 
Now, 10 years later, Picard and Worf have long left their roles behind from, the, uh, from Starfleet and the Klingon High Council. Picard and Worf reflect on their memories and feel just melancholy um, as they remember their crew members on the anniversary of their death. The origin and reason of the bombing has remained unknown, but Worf has received intel from an old contact, Ro, Ro Laren, that the bombing was ordered by Garrick, who lives with, deep within Cardassian space and works for the Klingon government, the Cardassian government. The Federation will not be able to act upon this information, so they decide to go rogue. Worf and Picard begin a journey deep into Cardassian space to hunt down Garrick, and they enlist Wesley Crusher to help them navigate the detection grids and use his computer skills to find Garrick. I really see this part being a bit of a, a kind of road trip movie. Something really where the crew are, you know, the pairing of Worf and Picard and with the addition of Crusher, really kind of reflecting on the next generation and kind of the characters. We see too often Picard's reduced to action, hero kind of status in these movies. I don't want to see that. I want to see a thoughtful Picard. I want to see one that's thinking, always a few steps ahead. And as the three make their way to Cardassia to hunt down, capture or execute Garrick, they arrive on Cardassia and they manage to get Garrick alone. Probably some sort of, like, hooking up his shuttlecraft to make it think that he's got to go here or there and something along those lines. Um, I'm not an action writer or any sort of writer, so I'll let someone fill that one in. But they manage to divert his shuttle and get him alone. Worf begins to torture Garrick for information, but he's still the master of deception and gives little away. Worf struggles not to plunge his Klingon knife into the heart of Garrick as he toys with him and then taunts him about Jadzia's death. Picard tries to hold back and restrain Worf, but the rage inside him takes place and he wipes off his head. But then Garrick's body then turns to flames as it's revealed that he's been possessed by the Parath spirit of Dukat, dun dun dun, who has returned from hell, from the hell-like conditions he's been trapped in. And Dukat has been going from body to body to try and sow revenge among the Federation and those who have worked against him. To be continued. <laughs> One, maybe I'll get John Logan or... Um, Brandon Bragger, Ronald Deemer to help me put together a wee ending there. But I really want to sort of, you know, that kind of movie where it's a simple idea and it's focused. It's not so much an action movie, but it's about reflection and really using just a couple of the elements of the Next Generation movie and really making a drama out of it. I can see it almost being similar in a way to something like Logan, for example. I suppose another Patrick Stewart movie um, and really kind of going down the river, as it were, kind of a simple story and tell it well and really highlight the drama as opposed to kind of turning it into the sci-fi action movies we often got with the Next Generation series. Hope you like my idea and thanks to Justin and uh, Richard for their ideas. Bye. Talking about the fifth TNG movie isn't the only thing we've been talking about here on the network. Here's a preview of what else you might have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, The Orb... When Lieutenant Saru says, I sense the coming of death. They could be playing Staying Alive, Staying Alive in the background. And like, whatever, man. <laughs> BG Sam, Staying We're Alive. Staying Alive. Aren't you listening to the sound system on this bridge? Man, you're bell bottoms too tight, boy. <laughs> that would be awesome if they had bell bottoms on the Discovery uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> Meta Trex. Garrick really typifies, personifies that snake-like way of kind of slithering around in the shadows, more subtle than any other character well, in the Star Trek universe. Plain, simple Garrick would be the first to say that the clothes make the Cardassian. <laughs> Primitive Culture, a look at history and culture through Star Trek. This episode was actually banned by the BBC for many years. And they always said, I don't know if this is true, not so much because of the kind of allegorical significance of the episode, but because of this uh, single line in it where Data says, he basically says, oh, well, you know, the IRA basically achieved what they wanted in, I think, 2024. 2024, it's, yeah. It's, you know, it's uh, <laughs> coming up. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all of these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. 
You'll find us wherever you get your podcast. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcast on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, speaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's shows, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best places to join the larger conversation is in the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. We love interacting with our listeners there. So join the conversation. If you'd like to send us an email, we love those too. You can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Earl Gray. That will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at Trek FM and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Trek FM. If you'd like to help keep all the shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more available through our special patrons web- website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all that details at patreon.com slash trekfm. Well, as always, we thoroughly enjoy you coming on to the show. I appreciate you coming on to the show, Justin. Every time you come on, it's very informative, and uh, you kick my butt every time uh, when it comes to trivia and everything else and background on it, and I, I thoroughly enjoy it. <laughs> but uh, we definitely learned in editing uh, the episodes when I'm not there. Uh, it's uh, very enjoyable to hear hear you on, uh, on the show. But if anyone would like to talk to you about... Um, Anything Star Trek, where can they find you? Well, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at TrekFan4747, where I tweet about nothing but Star Trek. And I'm currently tweeting about my TNG Season 2 rewatch. And you can find me hanging around the Babel Conference on Facebook. And you guys can find me on Twitter. My handle is xransom. I haven't started on SG-1 yet. I've been busy. For some reason, uh, The Last Ship has been my uh, show right now. <laughs> uh, but like, uh, you guys can also find me on Facebook. I pop in here and there on the Babel Conference. Causes a little trouble here and there, but that's okay. Join us for another cup of Earl Grey. Great joy and gratitude. Today is a good day to die.